Good morning, afternoon, or evening. I'm Brad Delman from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I'm going to be discussing the imaging of uh, facial fractures. When one looks at the epidemiology of facial trauma, uh, there are differences based on age and gender. Uh, so in the younger population, the non-geriatric population, men tend to be disproportionately uh, affected relative to women, at least four to one, whereas in the uh, geriatric population, there's more of a balance with a slight uh, female predominance. Uh, when one examines the mechanisms, there are some differences as well. So older patients tend to have falls as the most likely cause, whereas in younger patients, um, uh, sporting accidents, including bicycle injury and other sports and, and assault uh, in particular, tend to be most prominent. Uh, and then also looking at the type of fracture. Uh, there are some differences. So isolated orbital injuries uh, are more common in the geriatric population and isolated mandibular injuries are more common in the younger patient. We're going to talk about uh, many of these types of uh, fractures in the subsequent slides. Uh, in the pediatric population in particular, there are uh, three different types uh, or peaks uh, that one would look at. So the most common mechanism for injury uh, in the five-year or less population would be falls. Um, with uh, uh, about 28% of those requiring operative intervention. Uh, in the second half of that first decade, motor vehicle injury is the most common uh, with a greater incidence uh, requiring operative intervention. And then in older patients, interpersonal violence, IPV, um, uh, predominates up to the late teenage years. Uh, when patients have facial injuries, one should look for concomitant uh, trauma as well. Uh, the top three here, concussion, intracranial hemorrhage, and skull fracture, uh, along with cerebral contusion, account for almost 70% of the concomitant injuries. Many patients who get facial trauma will get a head CT. One could make the argument that with these numbers, every patient who has uh, significant facial trauma should get a head CT uh, because of the uh, concomitant or coincident uh, injuries which, which those patients can have. The imaging techniques uh, have evolved over time. I don't think anyone is doing plain film, uh, although if your CT scanner is down and you need to image, you may be called into service uh, to read some plain films. But I think in general, um, multi-detector thin section CT, and we're talking submillimeter uh, imaging, uh, I think is the most common uh, protocol to use. We at our institution generate bone algorithm and soft tissue for every uh, scan, and we have routine reformatting into orthogonal planes, which obviates scanning uh, into uh, different planes. And I'll show some examples uh, historically of what it looked like scanning in a native coronal plane. Um, the technique should be relatively low dose. We don't need to see excellent soft tissue uh, contrast here. We just need to know that there is soft tissue swelling where that exists. So most of our techniques should be considerably lower than a standard head CT. Uh, here's one from our uh, hospital where uh, the actual measured dose was around 0.3. 38 millisieverts, so fairly low. Uh, text should be able to do uh, oblique reformats on demand if you need to see a structure uh, in to better advantage, uh, and should be able to do volume rendering. Uh, the curved or dentist scan um, uh, reformatting is often not required, at least for the initial trauma. Uh, I think you can get away with an oblique reformat, uh, so most text should be able to, to help you with that uh, if you need to uh, problem solve. Um, talking about dose, uh, again, there are many different ways to lower dose. Uh, the conventional filtered back projection uh, can have quite a variable dose range, as you can see from the literature here, up to 3.6 millisieverts, which is a very, uh, I think, archaic and high dose. Most of our current technologies now uh, allow a considerably uh, lower uh, technique. So if you have ACER, uh, or a model-based uh, iterative reconstruction, um, you should exploit that to the extent possible to reduce the dose while getting good diagnostic yield. Uh, of course, the different techniques one uses will uh, affect images in different ways. And this uh, uh, paper showed uh, on a cadaveric study, uh, filtered back projection, different levels of ACER and model-based uh, iterative reconstruction and Clearly, the model-based reconstruction is the smoothest, but you also want to see the sharp bony margins. So uh, whatever technique you have, I would just make sure that the uh, scanner protocol is optimized for looking at subtle fractures because many of these facial bone structures are quite delicate. 
Traditionally, the facial bones are considered to be a lattice or a cross brace structure. Uh, so uh, the horizontal lattice would be would include the hard palate at the bottom, the um, uh, uh, floor of the orbit in the middle, and the superior orbit or the orbital roof at the top. Um, and though, and of course, the rim uh, would uh, buttress that area uh, and, and fortify that uh, those structures quite well. And then, of course, there are vertical structures. So the midline uh, structure, the nasal septum, the vomer, uh, the off midline structure, the uh, the medial orbital wall and medial maxillary wall, and then the lateral structure, lateral orbital rim and maxillary sinus. Uh, one structure that's not talked about, but certainly helps to prevent racking back and forth is the anterior uh, maxillary sinus wall because that uh, can um, contribute somewhat to stability. And this, of course, um, this pattern of cross bracing is, is used in architecture. It's very stable uh, until, of course, the moment of force is too significant uh, to sustain that. And that's when we would see the uh, fracture. Uh, the classic facial injury is the orbital blowout fracture. Uh, this results when a structure too large to fit through the orbital rim impacts the bony contour. It could be a fist, could be a ball, uh, maybe a frying pan. Uh, and that transmits force uh, through the bones. And the first phase here uh, of two phases is the bony transmission. And it's not unlike uh, the P wave in an earthquake. So the primary wave is a compressive wave. And that compression uh, causes fragmentation of the bone, but doesn't necessarily displace it. Uh, it's the secondary wave, the S wave, uh, which results from compression of the globe and recoiling of the soft tissues that results in the actual blowing out of the structures uh, um, into the orbital floor or immediately or wherever the, the orbital fracture uh, tends to go. So it's a biphasic structure. The, the sequence of events here is very rapid probably 25 to 50 milliseconds. Uh, so it's imperceptible to the uh, person being hit. Uh, and when you look at the type of uh, fractures you see, this is a common pattern where the floor of the orbit um, uh, is displaced into the maxillary sinus. As I mentioned, we used to do direct coronals. This was a coronal done in extension. Uh, so the, the neck, patient's neck is hyperextended. The patient is prone on the table, and that's why the fluid level is inferiorly. We don't do this anymore um, because patients who have facial trauma may have coexistent cervical trauma, and we don't want to exacerbate that. Uh, but this is a good example of the fluid level that one might see and the amount of blood that one might uh, see from an inferior blowout injury. Um, you can see fractures even on the axial source images. So the normal uh, contour of the orbital floor should be fairly um, smooth uh, and sweeping and maybe a little bit curvilinear as it is on this side. Uh, on the left here, there's clearly fragmentation of the orbital floor uh, and then protrusion of soft tissues into the maxillary sinus. So uh, you can often see these fractures even without reformats. Uh, it's often uh, a good idea to challenge yourself uh, if you see a abnormality on one plane to go back and try to see it on another plane, even if you wouldn't have seen it ordinarily. This is a very gross example. You will see some more subtle examples. Um, one consequence of a blowout fracture is an ophthalmo. So as the intraorbital volume is diminished um, uh, because the um, fat and muscles are displaced into the maxillary sinus, the globe will sink in. Uh, and this pattern that you see in the lower right is a classic uh, uh, feature. So you get uh, uh, prominence of the uh, superior sulcus. Uh, the lid drops down because the globe isn't protruding as much anteriorly, so there's nothing really to keep the lid up as much. Uh, and the actual uh, uh, orbital aperture uh, is, uh, is diminished compared to the contralateral side. So this is not an acute case. There's no uh, swelling here. Uh, so this patient is probably uh, many days to weeks out and presented for repair. Uh, but this is the consequence if a significant amount of intraorbital soft tissue is lost as a, as a result of trauma and is not yet repaired. One thing that you'll see acutely is uh, tremendous air, uh, or you can see it depending on what the patients do. So air doesn't happen naturally, uh, but as a um, 
uh, a natural history of the trauma. Uh, when someone gets hit in the eye and they get a nosebleed, which invariably happens, they will blow their nose. And in blowing their nose, uh, they, com- they increase the intranasal pressure. Uh, and that intranasal pressure forces air through the defect in the bone, wherever it happens to be, into soft tissues. So you start to see air in areas where you shouldn't expect to see it, uh, including within the orbit and then the superficial uh, emphysema or crepitus. Um, so much of this is actually um, uh, caused by the response of the victim after the trauma rather than the trauma itself. And it can be very intimidating. Uh, this is a very disfiguring appearance, albeit transiently, uh, for someone to see because it looks like there's significant soft tissue swelling when, in fact, it's air that will that should resorb felt relatively rapidly. Um, trauma can be quite severe. This is from the literature showing uh, an orbital floor fracture and the, the globe hanging out in the uh, maxillary sinus. Uh, most of our cases, fortunately, aren't this significant. Uh, I will point out here that there is deformity and irregularity of the globe. Um, we do not do a very good job at seeing um, globe perforation, uh, although if you see overlying scleral margins or deformity of the globe, we should at least suggest it. Um, so inferior blowout fracture, I think we see most commonly, uh, there is some debate in the literature about which is more frequent. Um, Inferior or medial, here's an example of an acute medial blowout fracture where there's fat herniating into the uh, ethmoid cells on the left and significant soft tissue swelling adjacent to that. You see that on the soft tissue window. You see it on the bony window. Um, It's something to to comment on. And of course, the globe looks like it's uh, retracted slightly uh, because of the volume loss in the orbit itself. Uh, You can see mixed patterns of inferior and medial blowout, as we see in this case. One of the interesting aspects of that 3D volume studies have shown is that we can calculate how much we expect the globe to regress uh, into the orbit based on the uh, volume loss of uh, orbital tissue. So in this case, uh, they measured 2.3 cm cubed, cubic centimeters uh, of herniation of tissue uh, into the maxillary sinus. uh, And their rule of thumb is that since every Roughly 0.7 cubic centimeter uh, of bony volume uh, expansion results in one millimeter of enophthalmos. This case would probably uh, result in about three and a half millimeters of uh, enophthalmos, uh, which would be uh, cosmetically significant and probably should be uh, repaired. Uh, This is a classic pattern for an assault case. Uh, Most of the orbital injuries from assault tend to be seen on the left because that's what a right fist strikes. In this case, we see significant emphysema, medial blowout fracture, nasal fractures, and extensive soft tissue swelling, all compatible with that pattern. I would mentioned the extensive emphysema. Don't be alarmed, but we do want to make sure that the uh, clinician is advised that much of what they're seeing clinically uh, is actually due to air rather than hemorrhage or edema. Uh, There's a balance uh, between what leaves the orbit and what enters the orbit. So if a patient has more escape of fat and muscle, uh, that is into the maxillary sinus or um, ethmoid cells, for example, if that predominates over the entry of air or hemorrhage or edema, the globe will sink in, and that is what we would perceive as anophthalmos. If the opposite occurs, if you don't have much escape of fat or muscle, but you have a lot of air, uh, from example, from uh, nose blowing, uh, that may be perceived as exophthalmos because you increase the amount of soft tissue pushing, pushing the globe out. And of course, they can be balanced. So if, if you uh, escape, have an escape of fat and muscle and a similar entry of air, hemorrhage, uh, and or edema, uh, the globe may look to be a normal position. It's important for us as uh, radiologists to highlight tissue um, escape that we see uh, because there's a balance between escape and entry. Uh, the patient may look normal in the ED, at least in terms of the globe excursion, and the ED provider may not appreciate how much globe excursion there is. But when they go home over the next few days and their globe sinks in as that air resorbs, uh, they can become much more symptomatic.
Amongst trapdoor injuries, there is a, a phenomenon called the oculocardiac phenomenon, uh, in which uh, afferent pathway uh, leading from the orbit through the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve into the brainstem leads to a vagal uh, suppression of the heart rate. So when patients uh, try to gaze superiorly, uh, they uh, develop bradycardia. This is an example of what happens after repair. So the image on on the top is uh, a patient who had an entrapped uh, orbital floor fracture on the right, and uh, you can see by these uh, reference lines, the midline of the pupil is significantly depressed. Uh, the globe looks a little anophthalmic, as we had so talked about earlier. The uh, superior fissure is exaggerated. Uh, and then after surgery, uh, looks like relatively close after surgery because there's still post-operative change, uh, the uh, pupil is now better aligned. So uh, many of these uh, uh, surgical procedures following blowouts are uh, aimed not at necessarily at cosmetic reasons, but a patient can't walk around with diplopia, uh, and so uh, a repair would be necessary. Additional techniques that can be used include mirror image overlay. So this is from the literature showing um, overlay of the left orbit, which is normal, uh, and superimposed on the right uh, to help with planning of uh, surgical repair and to ensure that there is a symmetric uh, resulting product. In the literature, there are older reports of how to uh, describe the degree of um, uh, tenting of the globe due to increased intraorbital soft tissue. So in this case on the top, you see an axial T2 image uh, with significant uh, proptosis of the right globe uh, and stretching of the, uh, of the optic nerve. Uh, it's important for us to at least recognize visually, you may not take an angle measurement, but to at least recognize visually when you start to see angulation of that posterior globe margin due to tethering by the optic nerve, uh, that probably does suggest a, a significant uh, uh, displacement of the globe uh, and may require uh, emergent surgical uh, decompression. Of course, surgery would be based on the clinical pattern. Uh, there are other types of injuries. We talked about inferior blowout, medial blowout. This is a rare posterior blowout. Uh, someone hit in the eye with a ball. Um, fairly uncommon, but note that the fat from the orbit uh, is uh, running into the middle fossa, and there's even some blood here, which looks like it's stopping at the suture. This is probably an extradural or epidural hematoma focally in the middle fossa. There's also a blow-in injury, uh, which requires a very specific moment of force on the lateral orbital rim. Uh, again, buckling here, um, causing significant displacement of fracture fragments, which could impinge upon the optic nerve, at least in the right area. Here it looks like it's below it, but note the intracranial air. One can see... Um, dehiscence of the lamina papyracea or medial blowout. And sometimes it will be unclear what um, is actually present. So in this case, uh, on the upper panel, uh, there's very smooth displacement of the medial uh, wall. And, and I can't tell whether this was a prior orbital injury or if this is dehiscence. Dehiscence typically stops at the basal lamella, which would be appropriate in this case. Uh, so distinguish that from the pattern below, where there's this marked irregularity stranding from the medial rectus into the, the defect, this is clearly a post-traumatic injury. You may not be able to tell the difference. I think if there's no soft tissue swelling and no visual symptoms, uh, that is likely to be uh, just watched, however. Also used prior studies. So this is a, a case that uh, came in for orbital injury, and uh, there's a defect in the right lamina papyracea, uh, fat extending into the defect. I didn't know how old that was. It looked very chronic, but when I looked under PAC system, I found a very old head CT from 17 years earlier, which showed the same defect. So do exploit the uh, prior imaging. Orbital rim injuries, when you see them, uh, again, there's a high likelihood of, of um, exposure of the sinus to the intracranial compartment, and that becomes an open uh, injury. So uh, in a case like this, it's not going to be a subtle diagnosis. There's multi-fragmentation of the right orbital roof through the uh, frontal sinus with soft tissue swelling in the sinus. Uh, here you can see a clear break into the uh, anterior fossa, uh, and you'd want to mention all of these things in your reports. It's important to decompress uh, orbital 
hematomas early. This is a patient who presented uh, relatively soon after trauma and has a subperiosteal hematoma. Here's a little fleck of bone that was displaced and downward displacement of the globe. This person elected not to have this repaired. Uh, and then on the follow-up exam, they had all of this new ossified uh, uh, response to that hematoma, and now their globe is permanently deflected. So if surgery is going to happen, it should happen soon after the hematoma so that it can be de de um, decompressed completely uh, and without uh, chronic sequela, as we see here. Ocular perforation, as I mentioned, is uh, not something we call well, but you may see it. Uh, in this case, there's an overlapping pattern of the sclera uh, suggesting that this uh, globe has uh, has ruptured. Detachments uh, come in two varieties, retinal and choroid. Uh, choroidal detachment does not quite meet the optic nerve head, uh, and that's because there are uh, vessels which sort of tether the most medial aspect of the choroid. Uh, so you'll see this sort of pattern here where you see the, the uh, as I like in a C uh, on a baseball seam uh, to choroidal versus this pointed pattern, uh, which I liken to the tip of an R for retinal. So this may help you uh, remember uh, which, which is which. Uh, one pattern that you may see following skull base Injury is a CC fistula. So this is a contrast CT showing uh, significantly um, enlarged left superior ophthalmic vein relative to the right. You see it on the axial projection, and you'll see it on the coronal projection. This in itself it should be suggestive of a CC fistula. If you do a time-resolved uh, MRA, uh, and you see early in the arterial phase, if you start to see venous drainage, and in particular, if you start to see the superior ophthalmic vein, as you do here, um, that suggests early communication and fistula. Uh, either a uh, dynamic CT, or in this case, time-resolved MRA, uh, can show you similar information. Uh, this is what happens when you do an angio. Uh, so this is a left internal carotid artery injection. And uh, right when you get up to the uh, cavernous segment, there's filling uh, uh, of the uh, cavernous sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, not only on the same side, but under the cella and to the contralateral side. So you shouldn't see venous filling on an arterial phase that suggests fistula this is what you see on dynamic injection. Following arterial pacification, there is rapid opacification of the cavernous sinus and other venous structures associated with this, including the superior ophthalmic vein, other orbital veins, pterygoid plexus, and inferior petrosal sinus posteriorly. Nasal injuries are probably the most common facial trauma, but we don't see most of them. Uh, if you look at the uh, contour of the nose here, it looks very symmetric, and the clinician may have trouble uh, determining where the fracture is per se. Uh, CT is going to show you uh, the bony um, landmarks to much better advantage, including some air uh, due to internal laceration. And these can be very subtle. Uh, here's a minor step off of the nasal bone uh, with some soft tissue swelling here. Again, very minor. Uh, findings. Um, look for them. You'll see them. The uh, nasal orbital ethmoid complex. Uh, here there's a depressed fracture. You can see the septum is also displaced, uh, multi-fragmented uh, on both sides. Uh, and of course, give a look to the nasolacrimal duct because if you have a bony fragment projecting into the duct, those patients may not drain tears uh, as effectively and may develop epiphora or, or the sense of, um, of tearing um, uh, due to impaired drainage. Another example here uh, where the nasolacrimal duct is affected. So on the left is preserved. It's nice and round, has a little bit of air in it. It may or may not have air. On the right, uh, that normal rounded contour is disrupted and, and part of the anterior wall is pinching into the nasolacrimal duct. So this needs to be repaired and needs to be repaired fairly rapidly uh, before the um, uh, before there's any fibrosis. Uh, so this patient does not uh, develop epiphora or at least permanent epiphora. Uh, frontal sinus can be fractured as well. If a patient has a well pneumatized frontal sinus, it may only involve the anterior wall, which is a good scenario. This is cosmetically apparent, uh, but at least there's no intracranial disruption. Um, this was, I think, a uh, shopkeeper who is uh, struck by a baseball bat. I'm in New York. Uh, these things can happen. Uh, but fortunately, uh, this is uh, only the anterior wall and resulted in a, a cosmetic repair only. Um, uh, another example here of blunt trauma to the uh, anterior orbital 
uh, sorry, anterior frontal bone um, into the frontal sinus. And in this case, there is a deflection of a bony cleft into the orbit. Uh, with downward displacement of the globe. So this does need to be repaired. Obviously, this patient is not going to have normal gaze uh, and will have cosmetic deformity uh, as well. Uh, when the posterior wall is breached as well, that again is an open injury. Uh, so bugs can get from the sinus into the intracranial compartment. Um, I think these patients probably buy themselves IV antibiotics as a precaution. Uh, the, uh, the injury here is through and through, uh, and there is you know, concern of what, of what happens with mucosa gets inside or if CSF leaks to the outside. So these patients will probably get follow-up studies as well. Uh, and another example here of both anterior wall and posterior wall disruption. Um, look for intracranial air. As I said, that's a very ominous sign. Surgeons need to know about it. The ED docs need to know about it uh, because that represents a more uh, aggressive antibacterial uh, regimen. brain may ultimately protrude through there, causing an encephalocele, which gets larger and larger over time. Um, and uh, if you're lucky, uh, you'll get an arrow uh, of sulci pointing to where your uh, defect is because the sulci gets stretched into the encephalocele. Uh, we don't do much cisternography anymore. I think that was a historically a good way to look for a leak. You didn't, you basically uh, would do a myelographic approach, inject contrast, tilt the patient head down and see where the contrast pooled. Uh, and in examples like this, if you see contrast in the sphenoid sinus, we know that there is a leak. Not a great mystery, right? Uh, currently, uh, and for the past 10 years or so, we've been doing a high-resolution CT and MR fusion technique, which has really obviated cisternography. I don't remember the last time we've done one. Um, uh, but using the uh, uh, a fusion technique where you have CT and MR and then the fused product together, you can look for uh, fluid where it doesn't belong and identify a potential source if there is a confirmation of CSF leakage, um, typically by uh, assay for beta transferrin. Zygomatico maxillary complex fractures, which used to be called uh, tripod fractures, involve the lateral orbital rim, the inferior orbital rim, zygomatic arch and zygomatico maxillary buttress. Um, uh, they also involve four sutures. Some people call them a tetrapod or had called them a tetrapod uh, fracture previously. I think we're all calling them now ZMC uh, complex fractures because that really gets the point across of what the mechanism here. Uh, there are different ways to classify this, different degrees of, of comminution. Um, I, in my approach to facial fractures in general is to describe the fractures, uh, not to give them titles, because I think titles can uh, maybe minimize the extent of injury. And I think the surgeons will want to know where every significant fracture line is. Uh, this is the classic appearance in a ZMC fracture, uh, where you have fragmentation uh, of the anterior maxillary wall, the posterior maxillary wall, uh, typically the uh, zygomatic arch. So you can have diastasis uh, or the arch fracture can be very uh, far posteriorly. Um, uh, and note that the anterior wall or the anterior soft tissues can be significantly deformed, though, as with orbital injuries, if there is significant blood products in there, a clinician may not appreciate how far posteriorly uh, set this fracture is. So it's, it's important for us to describe this in its, uh, in its entirety. Another example here showing what happens when all the air fills that soft tissue. Again, the clinician may not be aware, just looking uh, at the patient uh, uh, directly, uh, the clinician may not be aware of the extent of injury. So it's important for us to, uh, to provide that to them. Uh, not every fracture that involves a zygomatic maxillary uh, region is a ZMC complex fracture. This is a focal uh, trauma to the anterior maxillary wall. It affects the inferior orbital rim, but the uh, lateral uh, orbital rim and the zygomatical, uh, uh, zygomatic arch are both preserved. Uh, so again, don't give it a title uh, per se. Describe where the fractures are because uh, we don't want to misattribute or underscore something that, uh, which could have clinical relevance. Um, there are different types of uh, fracture patterns and different degrees of rotation depending on the moment of force uh, and differences between uh, low velocity and high velocity uh, 
uh, mechanisms. Um, in general, many of these can be very complex, particularly the higher velocity ones where you get uh, comminuted, uh, multiple comminuted fractures at multiple points, which uh, result in very complex repairs with many osteosynthesis plates uh, to bring everything into anatomic uh, alignment. Uh, a fracture line that goes through the uh, root of the tooth is usually considered an open fracture. Uh, um, the clinicians may want to determine tooth viability before repairing uh, these fractures to know whether the tooth should be preserved. Uh, but if you see a fracture line through the root of a tooth, uh, make sure you mention that in your report. Uh, following injuries, uh, they can the surgeons can get very good alignment and repair. So this is a patient that has significant soft tissue swelling, clearly asymmetry here. The anterior bony wall is significantly deformed. Uh, and six weeks later, after uh, plate placement, uh, a very nice and symmetric um, uh, result. One may see after a trauma, uh, partic particularly involving the posterolateral uh, maxillary wall, herniation of fat into the sinus. So this is a patient who had trauma uh, and then 11 months later, had another scan, and there's significant protrusion of fat into the sinus through what had been a prior fracture line. And I think it's the repetitive mastication that pushes that fat into the sinus, and it has really no obstruction once there's a fracture there, so you get more and more fat uh, protruding into the sinus, which can be quite significant, uh, as in this case, quite a significant amount of fat. Uh, we know there was trauma here, there's surgical uh, screws, uh, but uh, the amount of fat in here uh, presumably increased over time uh, due to uh, mastication and now represents a significant portion of the maxillary sinus. Submucosal, not to be worried about, uh, but just recognize that it's there. Uh, this is another uh, example of, uh, of a zygomatic arch fracture, which is comminuted. There's uh, a contact point on the uh, coronoid process here. Um, so this will have cosmetic implications later, not now, because soft tissue is swelling, uh, fills in the skin contour. Uh, but this patient isn't going to be chewing very well uh, with this um, uh, fracture line here. In fact, uh, they could potentially ossify across this fracture into the coronoid. So this really needs to be elevated and repaired. Lafort injuries uh, are sort of the classic complex injury that uh, besets uh, uh, the, the facial trauma victim. Um, these come in three varieties. I will say that they're often asymmetric, so the left side may differ from the right, uh, but at least at face value, the Lafort 1 is the floating palate, and I'll show examples of all these. Uh, the Lafort 2 is the floating maxilla, or the pyramidal fracture, and the Lafort 3 is the floating face, or craniofacial dissociation. Uh, Lef uh, Lafort was a French army surgeon who did things to cadavers, and you didn't think we could do it these days, but uh, we're still doing things like this to prove uh, fracture lines. I think Lafort's impressions were a little more simplistic than what we see now, what they considered high velocity, uh, uh, you know, 130 years ago, uh, is probably not such high velocity to us these days. So we're probably seeing more complex, more comminuted uh, fractures than, than, uh, than that uh, than Lafort did at his time. So Lafort 1 is the floating palate. That's a fracture line basically above the hard palate from the base of the nasal aperture back to the pterygoids. Um, basically all uh, or almost all Lafort injuries will involve the pterygoid plate. So if you don't see a pterygoid injury, uh, there's probably not a Lafort fracture. Uh, the converse isn't true. So you can have pterygoid fractures without a Lafort injury. So this is a Lafort 1 uh, seen just over the hard palate. Um, which may be difficult to see on an axial image. In this case, we're sort of tipped off here by the double density of the pterygoid. So this is a minimally fractured pterygoid plate with lateral displacement. Um, but what shouldn't be here is all this air. So when you see air in the soft tissues, I think we should be more uh, suspicious and uh, interrogate a little more carefully. Uh, and in this case here, you see fracture lines through the uh, pterygoid plates posteriorly and just above the hard palate anteriorly. So this is a Lafort 1. A Lafort 2 or a pyramidal fracture uh, also goes through the pterygoid plates, uh, runs under, for the most part, the uh, uh, the malar eminence, uh, but extends up to the uh, medial orbital rim. So instead of running along the floor of the nasal aperture, it runs above. Uh, you'll see Wassman 1 and Wassman 2 uh, as subtypes here. I don't think those are as clinically used, at least not at our institution, but you should be aware that that name exists. Uh, so examples of pyramidal injury, again, pterygoid plates are involved, so it's 
at least a possible uh, Lefort fracture, and the fracture lines along the medial orbital wall, uh, and then in this case, in extending into the nasolacrimal duct on the left and, and probably on the right as well. So this is an example of a uh, Lefort II. Uh, here's a more prominent example. Uh, we have extensive fracture lines, uh, including the lateral maxillary wall on the right, the anterior maxillary wall on the left, uh, um, and extending back to the pterygoid plates here. Uh, here, here, uh, and as you see where all the arrows are, these are all fracture lines. A Lefort III, or craniofacial dissociation, um, is a much higher injury. Uh, it involves the, both the medial and lateral orbital wall, including the orbital rim, uh, and you have to break the zygomatic arch or have some sort of diastasis to let this happen. So you want to look for uh, which one of those is present. Uh, this was a an old plane film, one of the few plane films in my collection. Uh, one of the few plane films I think I can read because I can see the fracture line through the lateral orbital rim, the medial or supramedial orbit on the right, also possibly on the left, but definitely the lateral orbital rim on the left. So this is a plane film example of a Ford 3. This is a CT example where you see the high fracture lines. Note that you see lower fracture lines as well. Um, Lefort injuries are not exclusive, so you can see asymmetric pattern, as I said earlier, or you can see two different fracture lines on the same side. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I don't like to use that gross classifier of Lefort fracture, uh, Lefort type 1, 2, or 3. I really like to describe where the fracture lines are because I think you have to be very uh, specific uh, with what structures are involved. Uh, and again, back through the pterygoid plates, which uh, you pretty much need for a Lefort injury. Here's another example, lateral orbital rim, uh, as well as inferiorly. So this is a Lefort 3 component on the right. This is a Lefort 2 component on the right uh, in the same patient. Uh, as I had mentioned, pterygoid plate fractures um, are almost always present with the Lefort, but you can see them in isolated sense. Um, uh, they tend to be associated with other types of fractures, though, not Lefort fractures when they are present. Uh, for example, ZMC, mandibular fracture, temporal bone fracture, etc. So make sure you do look for the pterygoid plates. They're very fine structures, and they're very deeply situated, so they're relatively protected. But when they do fracture, look for other uh, fractures. In this case, from the literature, there's a lateral pterygoid plate injury and then also a uh, temporal bone fracture uh, that goes along with it. Mandibular fractures. Um, are, um, as I said, different in frequency between the younger population and older population. Um, and there are different areas of susceptibility. So condylar region fractures are uh, susceptible due to the uh, binding of the wide uh, uh, mandibular ramus to the condyle through a thin, narrow condylar neck. Angle fractures are susceptible in a couple areas where the cross-sectional area tends to be thinner or by the molars, which is a, an intrinsically weak area. Symphysis, symphysis fractures um, are uh, noted in the region of the central incisors, uh, and then body fractures as well. Uh, so uh, look for all these different fracture types. In general, mandibular fractures are fairly easy to see, although the plane that you look at them on may not show them to the best advantage. So uh, exploit your multi-dimensional reformat, ask your tech if you need an oblique reformat uh, to show you uh, the structure uh, of the fracture line as well. Um, so here's a typical example where you have fracture um, uh, uh, posterior to the molars on the left uh, and then sort of in the mid arch on the right. Uh, the mandibular arch is a kind of a ring, uh, so you can see two fractures because it's a ring, uh, but you can see also see one fracture if one of the condyle subluxes. So a typical ring has to fracture in two places, right? Otherwise it can't fracture. The mandible, because it's a uh, it, Ha it, it's a partial ring, can fracture in two places, or it can fracture in one place with subluxation of the condyle, uh, allowing that first fracture to happen. So you want to uh, comment on that uh, if you, uh, uh, as, as you see it. Uh, the soft tissue swelling can be extensive. This is not going to be a mystery to an a ED or a trauma doc when they see this. Uh, extensive soft tissue swelling, they're going to know that something's going on there. If it's acute trauma, it's going to be a fracture. Uh, and the 3D reformat showing two fractures, uh, on this case, uh, on the left side, uh, although you can see them contralaterally as well.
Uh, some people will use uh, curved planar reformats or the, the uh, dentist scan. Uh, I think in general, if you don't have this ability available, certainly if you're reading a, a trauma rotation in the middle of the night and you don't have someone to do this for you, uh, you can just ask the tech to do an oblique reformat along the arch and you get almost the same information here. So this looks this uh, pattern here looks very similar to this pattern here. Uh, and you get basically the same information. You want to look at where the inferior alveolar canal is uh, because if that is disrupted, uh, the patient will have numbness in the V3 distribution, which um, would be an und undesirable outcome. Uh, so that's the end of this lecture. I thank you for listening, and it's been a pleasure.